I got into smuggling humans. Yes. How much do they pay? Anywhere from six to 9,000 a person. That's nice. I've seen all these runners using these go fast boats and they're all getting caught. But the way to do it is go slow on a catamaran. I'd send one captain here, another captain there. I had multiple boats. That was a mistake. I should have done it myself. I used to rent jet skis. And then I used to travel to Cuba from Key West for nefarious reasons. I wound up going to uh, Cuba on my uh, jet ski the, for the first time. When I got there, I bought a bunch of cigars. And what I did in the engine compartment, I, I sat there in the dark and I wrapped them up in tape and plastic and, and stuffed them inside the engine compartment. Boom, I'm ready to leave. When you leave, you got to clear out. Okay. And the, evidently, the, the guys I bought the cigars from snitched on me or... They saw me wrapping up the cigar boxes, putting them in my engine compartment. So they said to the, what, the, the Coast Guard there said, pull over? No, you, you've, you've got to clear out. So you got to pull over on okay. the way out. Uh, clear out. They uh, g- give you the blessings. You know, you've got the Coast Guard, the Guardia, um, and the doctor. Right. you got to go see when you leave as well. When okay. you, uh, it's the same process when you come into the U.S. as you go into Cuba. So the, the guy came up to me and goes, hey, uh, you got any cigars? And I bought two boxes from the US, uh, from the Cuban government store. I said, yeah, I got a couple boxes. And he goes, what do you got? And I showed him, I said, here, you got a receipt? On? I said, yeah, here's my receipt. I'm going, and then goes, you got anything else? Yeah, oh, you got any more? And I went, you know what? Yeah, he knows. I said, yes, I do. And I opened my compartment. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you thought you, yeah, what are you I, talking about? They, they knew. Okay. Yeah, he was setting me up, you could tell. So they took him. They confiscated him. The fact that I told them let me off. Okay. So I came back with two boxes. So you're cigars. not a great uh, cigar smuggler. No, I, I left that. Yeah. I got into something else. What was the other thing? Humans. Really? Oh, yeah. That's what I went to prison for. (laughs) So how'd that work? Let me backtrack. So I had to put my thinking cap on. I went over on a jet ski. I came back empty. You went over there on a jet ski? On a jet ski. I was the first guy to do that on a jet ski. Yeah, I get there five hours, and they treated me like a hero. And they said, oh, my God. There was a big news uh, reporter there. I was on Cuban television. They presented me with a, a bouquet full of Cuban product. And I'm going, what the hell? I can't bring this shit back. Right. I wound up giving it to the girls. <laughs> right. And, 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 and then you go to leave and they catch you with the cigars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of overlooked. They knew. Right. So, yeah. so you said you went back another time? Two, two more times on a jet ski. Uh, the third time, uh, I towed the jet ski back with a guy. So I, it wasn't a round trip. Uh, the first two were round trips. Okay. Uh, they said, Steve, don't do this again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I started uh, restoring uh, catamarans, 36-foot catamarans called the uh, McGregor 36. It looks like an oversized Hobie cat. Huge hulls and trampoline, netting, and a hard deck on the back. I think I had six of them. So what I did was I painted them pink. Pink Cadillacs. So right. AT. That was the uh, the deal. Now I was getting into drug smuggling. So you weren't any good at the cigars. So I moved so you moved to drugs. drugs. And I said, I said, okay, man, I, I'm very comfortable offshore. And I'm going, yep. Go to Jamaica, pick up a load, sh- 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 work it out. I, living in Key West, you it's like being in prison. Uh, the education you get and the contacts in the criminal world are unbelievable. You know, you learn a lot in prison. Right. I have contacts. <laughs> Had you been to prison yet? No. Okay. But being in Key West, it was just like that. Okay. We had, <laughs> it was a lot of guys down there just kind of hanging out, like hiding. People that out. didn't want to be found were in Key West. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I had drug smugglers, friends, you know, and they gave me some information. Hey, we got contacts here. Meet this guy. Blah, blah, blah. 
here's the deal. Here's the U.S., here's Jamaica, and you got Cuba. So you got to go around, okay? What I did was I had these catamarans, and I thought to myself, everybody was doing go-fast boats. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's like a red flag. They see you. They track you. They know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I said, the way to do it is go slow on a catamaran. Right. Seven knots, nice and easy. And I thought, well, okay, what am I going to do if they stop me? I said, real easy. You know these um, fiberglass uh, the tubes that they use in the road construction for uh, sewage, I guess? Some are six inches, some are 12 inches. They're uh, uh, probably 20 feet or 12 feet, 20 feet in length. Okay. Are they fiberglass or PVC? Well, it's a PVC. PVC, yeah. Yeah, it is PVC. Well, they have caps for the ends as well. Yeah. So I said, okay, this is the deal. I'm going to get a couple, stuff them with. And I put them on the inside hull of the catamaran above the water line. And I'm going to have a quick release in case the Coast Guard stops. On the caps, I'm going to have cement. So it'll just hit the bottom, you know, release from the boat. And they'll never find any on me. As long as they don't float. No, they don't. They enough. won't. They're, yeah, okay. I had enough cement. You had enough cement? Yeah. yeah. I tested that. Yes, yeah, so they're sitting there bobbing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The ocean. What, what's that? Um, well, interesting. What I did was I put them on a, um, a, um, a rigging, a wire, and, a, and they hung down 20 feet. And I had another quick release right on the deck that you wouldn't know it. Okay. It existed. So what I was going to do is, if the Coast Guard stopped me, I'd drop them. I still got them. Right. And deal with the Coast Guard. If they went ahead and did a search, did a, you know, um, a check on me, if they left, I'd be good. Okay. You know, I'd still have my load. If not, I'd just quickly jump and drop them. Right. And they'd quickly go down. So um, that was my idea. So the multiple catamarans, um, they were pink for a reason, because they were obvious, obnoxious. And in Key West, I started a water sport uh, um, catamaran business. And I had my catamarans go past the Coast Guard every day. Now, you see, uh, if you become familiar with a pink catamaran, you see it every day, it's familiar. Right. I had another catamaran up the uh, coast in about my marker 23, Kajau kind of hidden. I had another one that I was going to send to Jamaica to load. And what would happen is that they load, another one's on the way, load on the way, and I just do this. What was it, 200 pounds? If, if you get caught with more than 200 pounds, it steps up to a higher charge. Right. It was something... Yeah, yeah. Along that was that your, the sentencing guidelines or something? Yeah, the, federal sentencing guidelines. So what I did was I said, "Ha ha, I'm only going to bring 175, but I'm going to do it multiple times." Yeah, and so you know that defeats the purpose, right? They just keep adding it up. How long? It, how many times have you been doing? Has this been happening? You know why I'm so good? No, because I've made so many. <laughs> because I've made so many mistakes. Right. I had nobody to uh, teach me. Right. I did this on my own. I say, oh, yeah, I'll outsmart him. Yeah, I won't go slow. And they bring less than 200. And so I get caught. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm thinking, yeah, it was a big deal back then. Well, in the interim, I'm painting these catamarans pink. I, I had two already. I'm doing the third one. So uh, I had a friend of mine come up to me and go, Steve, I I've got some people I want to bring into the U.S. Can you go over there and pick them up? Maybe. How much would you pay? Uh, nice. I said, yeah, well, what do you got? He got How much do they pay? Anywhere from six, 9000 a person. That's nice. Back then, it was nice. So... Uh, I mean, you could just do the same thing. You just tie like a, a concrete block to <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah, the, co the yeah. Coast Guard pulls up. <laughs> there you go. So I started doing some of those. Don't, <laughs> Who are these people? Are these like... One was his brother. What? Okay. Yeah, so... Um, and this is... So you talked to a guy that was in Cuba. 
No, in Key oh, West. In, the, in Key yes. West, his he's, he's, brother, why is his brother not able to come into the United States? Now, now you're getting to the meat of this. Right. He was from Georgia. Georgia, he, Alabama, the, I mean, uh, Georgia next to South Carolina. Yeah, no, 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 the country Georgia. Uh, yeah. He was in the Russian organization. Okay, okay. His brother couldn't come into the U.S. They, they wouldn't give him. You see, there was a war going on in Georgia against Russians. Yeah, the okay? Rus Russians invaded Georgia. A long time ago. Yeah. And I, I guess there's still some Issues. stuff going on right now. But they used to go ahead and apply for political asylum right from uh, Georgia. U.S. cut them off and said, no more. We're not going to do that. It was just overwhelming. And they fit all the criteria to get political asylum. So everybody was trying to leave Georgia during the conflict and come to the U.S. I say that because that's going to be important. I was going to say, well, once you're here, will they send you back? No. What you do is once you get here, uh, you go to an attorney, you apply for a political asylum, you've got carte blanche. You're good for at least two years. 95% of all the Georgians that applied got. All right. I was going to say, it's like the Cubans come over here. Like, you, we catch you in the water, they send that's you back. Right. But yeah, right. they but don't do can, that now. Yeah, I know, but back yeah, then, if you get here... All you got to do is touch the land. Yeah, if you can get on foot, shore, dry foot. You can get here, then you can say, hey, political asylum. Yeah, you got it. So um, I started getting into the business. Uh, but I thought to myself, well, I'm only going to do like two or three. Just, and, just a little yeah, bit. Just a just couple. A little bit. You know, that's just to wet my beak. Yeah, I'm just, just about just, people. I'm not looking to make a, a lot of money. Yeah, just people helping people. I'm just trying to do the right thing. Actually, I was thinking, well, let me do this in the interim while I'm working this deal. That's, so I said, yeah, oh, and there's a, big, a good filler. I had two captains. I said, okay, here's the deal. We fly them into Dominican Republic. We pick them up in Luperon, fly them into um, the Bahamas, pick them up in uh, Nassau or uh, Bimini. Throw them on a pink boat. Throw them up, yeah. And... I say, drive right past the Coast Guard. Are, right. are these all people from Georgia, or are these other people? Almost exclusively. Okay. But other people, like maybe Cubans, or just other countries, no, too? Or? I never did a Cuban. Okay, really? Okay. Um, but they're coming from Cuba. No, are they coming from Well, Well, they, no, they're coming from uh, Dominican Republic or Nassau. I had a group that flew into Cuba, but it didn't work well. So one time, I went ahead and uh, had this family pay me some money, to pick up somebody okay. that's being prosecuted, persecu persecuted in Cuba, and they want to get him out quick. So, Do we uh, get to know who the family is? No. Okay. No. That's fine. It was it's a cash deal. Right. <laughs> I didn't give him a receipt. Okay. <laughs> it was no contract. Um, I might have something somewhere. Who knows? Um, I wasn't too clever back then. You know, I was just starting my career. <laughs> it's a criminal. So I go over in my little bug about boat, little nine feet by seven foot boat, unsinkable, unflippable. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, I go over there and I'm supposed to be at a particular point at a particular time. And I wait, um, I go ahead and I'm there. Nobody shows up. Big spotlight comes on me. Boom. I haul ass. Um, in the process, in the middle of all this, my heart rate is going a mile a minute. All of a sudden, I see fireflies. I'm going slow motion. I'm going, wow, this is beautiful. It's right above my head. I'm going, oh, look at these fireflies. It took me about a millisecond to realize the tree surrounds. Okay. Right over my head. And I went, <gasps> boom. <laughs> I just skedaddled. And uh, now, I am sure that it was way higher over my head than real close, but it was. It seemed like I could touch them. Right. And if they wanted me, I'm sure they just they, uh, dropped down. They could have blasted me right out of the water. I knew there was a Coast Guard base, Cuban Coast Guard base there, and I'm quite sure that they were going to send somebody out to intercept me while I was on my way back to the U.S., Instead, I went towards Mexico, and I kept that going, I kept that going, and I just wanted to get into international waters. I was going to call 
I, I pop my ear, call the Coast Guard to tell them arrest me, get me out of here. Uh, instead, I made a big wide circle and I came back. And sure enough, uh, 40, 50 miles offshore, I get picked up by uh, a Coast Guard cutter. Comes right up on me. It was called the Peanut Island. Huge Coast Guard cutter. And they put the bow of the boat right on top of me. Some guy up there goes, What are you doing out there? I looked at him, I said, boating. <laughs> and he's there talking to Lauren Helm, the captain. They say, follow me behind in my wake. So I follow him all the way back to Key West. Uh, another Coast Guard boat, a smaller one, comes out, picks me up, brings me in. They were in codes with the Cubans. They knew. The Cubans will notify them. Hey, we got some guy in a small boat coming back. Blah, blah, blah. Thank God I didn't pick up anybody. Right. Uh, so what do you think happened to them? Uh, so, see, Cuba has a funny system. Everybody rats on each other. And uh, he probably told somebody that told somebody that he's supposed to get ready and that Friday or whatever it is, whatever day is his departure day, they had a celebration. Everybody saying goodbye, goodbye, good luck. And, you know, word gets out, boom, somebody turned him in. Mm-hmm. So they grab him, squeeze him. He confesses, saying, yeah, this I'm, I was supposed to meet at this time at this place. There was a large truck right next to uh, the location. It was a, a vacant lot um, that had this big uh, spotlight, huge spotlight. I'd say a, a 15 feet diameter, huge on this truck. So that's probably what happened. I'm, I'm quite sure. You know, somebody snitched them out, and then they squeezed them, and he... Because there was just no way they were going to find you. Or, there was no yeah. way that they knew. So he didn't keep his mouth shut. And I still got paid. Right. So, <laughs> money up front. Right. Isn't that what they say? Money up front? Yeah. Yeah. I am. I don't guarantee, but if anything happens... I'll be there if you're not. I'll be there. Hit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was a lucrative little business. And were any of these guys from the Middle Eastern persuade of, of Middle Eastern persuasion that were Georgia? Just okay. Here's what happened. Yeah. Okay, so it was the Russians. Okay, okay. Now, the organization. <laughs> it was the Russians. Yeah, that's got to be in the in the. That's got to be part of the clip, right? Like it was the Russians. It was the Russians. Yeah, they had this system where, actually, the U.S. government had a program where if people from the uh, Eastern Bloc countries came to the U.S. and get a work permit, usually up to six months. Well, they'd bring them over, and they'd either marry an American or just overstay. Okay, that was typical. Well, it's nicer. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> Whatever. And so the love is in the air. But what they did was they went ahead and they, it was almost like an employment agency. They would work, put them in positions uh, in the strip clubs, in the hotels, in the restaurants. They supplied a lot of workforce, especially in Key West. And like 90%. This is like... Every the, dollar. This is the Russian uh, mom. This, uh, <laughs> this that's what that, yeah, that's okay. what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Every hour that they worked, the Russians got a dollar. Now, if they paid for them to come over, let's say the flight was $500. They charge the guy seven hundred. They'd put him in a house with nine others. Charge him five hundred, six hundred. They'd make extra money on that as well. This is the system, and it went from Key West up to New York. If you go ahead and Google, they did a big bust in New York. So I got into this smuggling humans, right? You know, and I did several, a couple, right? Maybe more than a couple. But I'd always do like two or three, one, two, three, you know, something like that. I'd do a couple myself. And then and then the other captain. Do the other captains realize what's happening? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, oh, so God. you want this guy who doesn't <laughs> speak English to come get on the boat. Yeah. It, it doesn't listen. sound fishy at all. No. no they, listen, it's Key West. Right. And they, <laughs> There's all these captains they, already have issues. They were, actually, they were legal captains. They were oh, just... There were guys like Mike. They, they were they guys that had a lot of experience, but they had different backgrounds. That yeah. They couldn't yeah. become a captain. I'm anyway. curious, what is the game plan? Like, how are you, you know. Here's the game plan. Okay. It's real simple. 
you bring them over because they stop giving political asylum or they stop giving visas in Georgia, in their own country. Mm -hmm. If you bring them to the United States, you declare them in. Right. Homeland Security will slap you on the wrist, say, okay, listen, you're going to have to pay a fine, up to $1,000 per person. You got two weeks. That's all you need. You get them right to the attorney. We had an attorney on, on uh, uh, already advised what, what to do. You get them to the attorney, he do a, a political asylum, the guy's legally here. That's the way to do it. Okay. And... and and the game plan for you was to do, you said he was just going to do a few of these. Yeah. And on the water, like, is there, do you have to try to hide these people or, you know? Generally speaking, no. So, and, and, like, if you got. I'll tell you an interesting story, a real side uh, story. I was coming myself. I picked up uh, two people from Georgia and they were on my catamaran. I was coming from Bimini and I was going over to Fort, Lo no, Miami. I was going to Miami. I get stopped by the uh, Coast Guard. They trail me. They get on the radio. This is the United States Coast Guard. Uh, please identify yourself. Hi, oh, Captain Steve. Go. How many people on board? Oh, there's just three of us. Where are you guys from? I'm from New York. These guys are from Georgia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then where are you going? Oh, we're going over to uh, Miami. Okay. Have a nice day. They took off. I went, Man, I got it. <laughs> got him in. <laughs> anyway, uh, they were brothers. Uh, yeah, I dropped them off in Miami. They were picked up. At God knows where they are. <laughs> Working in a strip joint. A strip joint. That's the program they had. But uh, by the way, another side issue is if the girls that were good looking, that were brought in, they would go to the strip clubs. If they weren't good looking, they'd go to housekeeping. <laughs> and that's the system. Right. Um, like I said, it was very prevalent in Key West. So I had a little side business. Um, I'd send one captain here, another captain there. I had multiple boats. Pink. Right. Pink boats. Um, Plus you're doing the... the I, no, these were the boats that I was gearing up for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I never really got... I got busted doing this, this small-time stuff. So when you first started, like what, what was your motivation to like start doing this? It seems like you really hadn't had much of a career, uh, criminal career before that. Was it? No, I know about financial <laughs> or what do you think? Like huh. what, how you're wired, like what made you want to do that? Golly, you know, that's a good question. And I, because I don't do things for money generally. Uh, there was, there, yeah, there's a financial gain. I think the notoriety, the uh, adventure, the uh, trying to, you know what it was? I tried to outsmart the government. That's what it was. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a new way of doing things. I've seen all these drug runners using these go fast boats, and they're all getting caught. How dumb. Okay? So, what do you do? Go slow. Hide it. Have a quick release. I mean, it was, it was logical to me. And I went, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I, I'm a... <laughs> it didn't work. You never got there. Well, I never got that. All right. Stupid me, but... Yeah. Well, it's not too late. <laughs> I'm halfway there. Yeah, oh, no, no, I knew a play. No, no, no. I sold my boats, by the way, to a guy in Belize. Well, he's got three of them. He's running. I was just there uh, four weeks ago for two days. Um well, this gets into my uh, charge, right? Of uh, <laughs> my, my okay. federal charge, right? And uh, what happened was, so here's the deal: we got a uh, boat going to the Dominican Republic. I had a requirement to pick up two people from uh, the Bahamas. I was going to do that. All of a sudden, there's a tropical storm. Boom! I had to cancel that. I sent that captain. With this boat to Bimini, I said, "Just go over to Bimini, pick up these boom, two, boom, 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 and then we'll send you on to uh, Dominican Republic." That was a mistake. I should have done it myself. So he goes over, picks up two people, and he's coming back. He comes Angelfish Cut. It's in Key Largo, south of Miami. Uh, he's coming through there at night, two in the morning, 
and it gets pulled over by Homeland Security. Midnight Express boat with four engines. Boom, they picked them up at 2 in the morning. He was supposed to go to Gilbert's. And once he got to Gilbert's uh, marina, he was supposed to declare in. Okay, that was a whole deal. Instead, he gets pulled over, and the first question they asked him, said, hey, guy, where are you coming from? He goes, oh, I'm coming from Key West. How many people on board? Just me and my mate. So they searched the boat, found two people. He made it uh, a, um, a human cargo right. Um He didn't need to. All he had to do was tell him the truth. Hey, I've got two people on board. I'm going over here, and I'm going to declare them in. Right. And they would have said, well, make sure you declare them in. We got you. The bottom line was that when he left Bimini, they tracked him. Yeah. They knew. And then when he lied, and for the life of me, I have no clue why he lied. His response was, I was afraid. But we went over this. Right. You know, you, you were legal. Why would you be afraid? He made it into uh, an illegal activity, which right. it wasn't right. designed to be. So... What if he answered the questions correctly, then it appears to be perfectly legal. You just answered it and made it illegal. That's right. That's what happened. So now, what does he do? Turns on me. Right. He's the snitch. Right. And he goes, oh, yeah, Steve Kosis. Oh, Steve Kosis. They all know who you they, are. Yeah, they know who I was, who I am. And so they go ahead and they approach me. I get arrested. Okay. They want to make a deal with me. Well, how do they, they arrest you? How does that happen? They... Call you up on the phone and ask oh, you to no. stop by? Oh, no. That morning, at 6.30 in the morning, mind you, I was up packing my truck. I was going out of town for a while. Okay. Good, because you knew he'd been I pulled over. the heat was on. As I'm packing, I've got all these documents in this briefcase. Boom. I just put them in my uh, truck. The open window, put them in the truck, and I look up, and sure enough, they're coming. And they came, two guys, and I got arrested. When I got arrested, I asked them, I said, hey, do you mind if I go ahead and roll up my windows and lock my car? So they opened the door, they rolled up the window and locked the car for me. Mm. All the incriminating stuff was in that car, in the briefcase. When I got busted, arrested, they uh, they took my boat. I had $75,000 in that boat. Mm. And uh, I had brand new equipment, brand new tools, brand new everything. It was loaded. That was my favorite boat. Did they don't boat. give it back? No, 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 <laughs> no. I asked them. <laughs> I tried to tell them it's not my boat, it's somebody else's. Right. Yeah, it didn't work. Anyway, I get arrested. They don't want me. They want me to go ahead and testify against Mr. Big. Okay. Okay? I go... You gotta be freaking kidding me. The guy with the Russian mob. The the ah. Uh, like, you like you gotta be. be kidding me. They will kill my kids. <laughs> I am not going to testify against them. Right. You're absolutely not gonna get me. So what they did, they uh compounded my charges. They it was a minimum mandatory. Boom. I got a minimum mandatory thirty six months. I sat there in trial and just bit my tongue. And, you know, I went ahead. And you went to trial or you oh, let you took no, a... I went to trial. Oh. I was too smart for myself. I'm going, wait a second. I went to law school. I could figure this out. There's five elements. They've only got three. I said, they're going to figure it out. They can't. Boom. So I go to trial. What did they do? They manufactured the evidence for the two elements. And I sat there going, I can't believe they just did that. And do you know what they said? If there was a financial transaction involved, it elevated it into a mandatory, okay. minimum mandatory. The people, the two people, it was a guy and a girl. By the way, the girl was the daughter of a former president of Georgia. Right. That's what, yeah, I was going to say that the, so the, the two people that were caught on the boat they handed over to the captain $2,000. The $2,000 was supposed to go, remember I told you it was a legal transaction, 
Well, once we get to the dock, we call Homeland Security. They're going to get pissed and, and fine you up to $1,000 per person. That's what the $2,000 was for. However, the prosecutor turned it around and said that was my that money was destined to me and that was my financial gain for doing this. Oh, okay. So that's probably one of the elements. What that was, was what one was of it? the elements. Yeah. yeah. And I thought they would not do something unscrupulous like that. Why you were you're, oh, you're was I naive? Yeah. Boom. So ain't guilty. Thirty six years. Oh, thirty six months. Yeah, thirty six. And uh off to jail I went. Right. Yeah. Were you still married at that time? No. Okay. No. So what happens to all your your did you get out on were you allowed out on um uh, like, did they let you out on uh, probation or anything? Not probation. A bail. On, on bail or anything? Well, when I got arrested, yeah, I was in there for a week. I went out on bail uh, for three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and then Quite I three months? To, well, for the trial. Okay. You know, it took that long for the set the trial. I think it was in January. Yeah. Okay. So I was so free. How long, how long a trial? A day? Two days? Three, you know, like two, three days. Yeah, okay. two, the, two and a half days, I believe it was. Yeah, boom. I mean, the judge slammed me. I went, oh, my God. Okay, three years. Mm. I took that. I, I had a rule 35. Yeah. Do you, did they let you Did they let you turn yourself in? Or did they take you right then? Guilt, uh, they found you guilty, and they grab you right there in the courtroom, or did they let you? Yeah, right there in the courtroom. Oh, okay. Boom. Because sometimes. I got incarcerated right then and there. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes they'll allow you to turn yourself. I asked them. I said, listen, I got a business. But what I had done was in, in the three months, I knew what was coming down. Yeah. And I packed everything up and put it in storage. Okay. For you, you were prepared. Okay. I, the best I could. Yeah. I thought I was going to get away with it. But just in case, you know, I got my kids. I didn't want to leave them with a big mess. Um, How old were your kids at that time? Quality. Adults? Yeah, they were adults. Okay. They were both married, living in Key West on their own. All right, so you have somebody that's... Willing. My son's a fireman. My daughter's works for the electric company. Okay. Uh, they have kids. I'm a grandfather. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> so what? So you get found guilty. You're guilty. I, I'm guilty. I go away. Three but years. Three years. What was interesting was these guys... And I had a relationship before they busted me. These guys, uh, the the Homeland Security. Okay. In fact, I was in their office the day they got I got busted. What the was, day before? What was that relationship? Wow! I worked at a, a hotel, a front desk manager for a, a hotel. This German guy was going to Cuba, and a couple of times he went to Cuba with me. He owned the hotel. I worked for him. He was going over to Cuba, and he would never hang out with us, but he'd take off for a week or so. What he was doing was, um, he was a... Oh, okay. And he was going ahead and recruiting young girls and having sex with young girls. He'd have a scout. He would call a scout. A young girl that he paid money to recruit other young girls. And he was doing this for quite some time. Like the uh, Epstein... Oh, but with uh, it was, what's her name? The what's her, I forget her name. The chick that Gilsling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was a recruiter. You know, um, this is a long time ago, and uh, he got away with it for a long, long time. However, at the hotel in Key West, a buddy of mine that subsequently worked for me uh, was his IT person. He made the mistake of taking pictures and he downloaded it on his computer the IT guy had copies of them all I turned them in right <laughs> all right what well, did you when before the, beforehand before I got arrested before I was doing this criminal activity yeah so you were but, already ready to just cut this guy's throat because yeah, things are bad. I, I, when I when I really? found oh, out yeah. what he was doing I, I went, oh, mother. In fact, I went over to Cuba, and I contacted some of the recruiters, mm-hmm. uh, the scouts, recruiters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the scouts, and uh, they gave me a list and the information. I tape recorded it. I had them sign a piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. The IT guy 
had moved to Cuba and was living in Cuba and had all the incriminating diskettes of the pictures, Homeland Security couldn't go over there, not without uh, major um, um, problem with them. With the, they'd yeah. have to get visas to go in there for the reason, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, so I went over and got the diskettes for them. Right. So subsequently, that allowed me to get a Rule 35. I got one year dropped off. Well, so, so I only did two years. Okay. And so what happened? So they, they continued that that prosecution of this guy while you were incarcerated right and they come to you one day do they show up at the prison and say hey they pull you out and say you got to talk to these guys well my my attorney your attorney went ahead and said, worked out going said on. hey listen steve's been working with you on this we'll get a request of rule 35 they said sure no problem okay yeah um well so so but so you still did two years yeah i did two years almost so, to the day where'd you go in the two years uh miami downtown okay uh, Oh, that was bad. Right. People, oh, scumbags. Uh, you know, right. I don't know if you can. Um, yeah, that was not a good place. My my introduction to the federal system. Okay. Uh, after that, they set me up, stopped at Cole. Right. Cole, and then uh, Pensacola. And I did most of my time in Pensacola. At the the camp. The camp. Yeah. Yeah. No fences. Yeah. So, uh, However, it's a, an old military base. Interesting enough, I was in the Marine Corps. As an officer, flight student, and I used to fly from that base right there. I knew the area well. Right. Um, how long were you there? Did were you? I mean, what'd you do? They give you a job? Oh, I had a job. Everybody's got a job. Most people will go uh, cut grass, and you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not me. They put me in the kitchen, and I worked my way in to the vegetable department. Okay. I was the only veggie guy out of eight hundred and twenty people. They used to lock me in this one room, and I'd either crack open, you know, a couple thousand eggs for the next morning, cut up onions, cut up peppers, uh, salads. I was the king of the campus. Why? Right. Because on the weekends when they had off, they had little kitchens in every one of the dorms, and they would make pizzas and, and cook you know, outside the mess hall or dining room. What year was this? There you go. What year? It was a blur. I got out. Well, it was over 10 years ago. Yeah, okay. About 10 years ago. So people wanted. So you were in your 60s? Probably. <laughs> yeah, f late 50s. Late 50s. Okay. Yeah. That's why they've kept me in the uh, kitchen and not in the fields cutting grass. Right. Okay. So. They wanted onions and peppers. I would sell onions and peppers a dollar a piece. And you know how that system works, right? Yeah, yeah. Sardines or uh, stamps. Yeah, yeah. The, the packets of uh, sardines or uh, mackerel that they have <laughs> they, they, these uh, sealed, like, uh, yeah, I forget what they're yeah. hermetically sealed. I forget what they call them. Yeah. That just is a vacuum sealed packet. Nothing. You can buy them in the stores here, yeah. and they're like sardines or uh, Mac you know, well, mackerel or or, or um, whatever in these packets. But each packet is worth about a buck. I don't know what they were ten years ago. They were about ninety nine cents, right? Well, yeah, it was a dollar. Oh, a dollar for, yeah. for us. So it's a dollar. They're a dollar, and then also or or stamps. Two stamps is a dollar back then. I don't know what they are. We, now. we had dollar stamps. Dollar stamps. Yeah, okay. so that was the. Uh, so you'd be trading. Yeah, because you can't have yeah. cash. You can't have money. Yes, and then somebody somebody ends up getting enough of them, and then they end up buying them, and then they they've got them, and then they say, "Hey, if you want, so you've got a, you got a hundred mackerel. If you want, I can put eighty dollars on your books, which means I can have somebody on the street send eighty dollars to your account, so you can buy stuff from commissary, you can use the telephone, you can do whatever. So he just made twenty percent." So he's got the mackerel, back, and then he, he sells that in, that mackerel to the bookie. So the bookie's pet, you see what I'm saying? It's like this whole it's just, hey, system. You, just, you want somebody to wash your uh, shoes? A mackerel. Yeah. You want somebody to do your uh, linen, to take your bedding once a week to the laundry, stand in the line, come back, make your bed? You know, a couple yeah, yeah. dollars. Yeah, five bucks a week you know, for a dollar a day. I'll, somebody cleans your room, makes your bed. 
get your laundry. You got guys that will organize your stuff, guys that will keep all your stuff in your your locker, in their locker, so that your locker is not packed full of crap. Yeah. You have a nice, very Stash. clean, organized lock, yeah. and all your stuff's in their locker. Yeah. And then, because if you have somebody on the street that can move money around for you, <laughs> listen, these guys, they're guys in there that leave, they'll, 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 they'll leave they'll prison with, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the bank. Yeah. So I, I had a personal trainer, I, everything. Right. I was good as gold. I was the only one, the only person that was, I was called the transporter. Right. I was the transport. And, you know, in, in prison, you have different levels of uh, status. Yeah. There were judges, there were attorneys. So I was a transporter. Right. And I'm up there. Right. Um, in the hierarchy at the prison. Nobody messed with me. More importantly, I was a veggie guy. Right. I made money. Right. <laughs> or sardines or stamps. I had a scam going. I would take Wonder Bread bags, the plastic bags, cut up the onions, cut up the peppers, stuff that bag, and put them down my pant leg. Right. And I'd walk out uh, every day with uh, a bunch of onions and um, peppers. Also, eggs. We used to smuggle them out. I'd put them in the bottom of a garbage can, put a plastic bag over them, put garbage in that plastic bag, and when the guy came to empty it, he'd bring it out back. There'd be a couple runners, <laughs> cartons and cartons of eggs. They'd go to different dorms. Any possible way to make money, it's being done in prison. Yeah. So how long... So eventually they, they reduced your sentence... To two years. Two years. Yeah. And then you... what? So did you get did you get halfway house? No halfway house. I, I got released. Okay. And... Uh, did, is it because I did get the, probation. Is it because the reduction came through so quick you couldn't get halfway house? Or did you not want halfway house? Wow. Um, it wasn't an option. Really? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I got probation. So uh, that scared me, probation. Okay. I thought for sure they're going to go ahead and violate me for some thing I didn't do. You hear all these horror stories. Oh, you hear the horror stories. So I kept myself clean. And the last week of my probation, I was terrified. Huh, right? So, Lizzie, you're the only person that has said that everybody else is like, you must be thrilled. Listen, the last month of my, I did five uh, years. Last month, I was tr I was just like I was, waiting for something bad to happen. I know. I thought I'm coming back. Everybody's like, oh, you should be so thrilled to relax. Like, no, this no. Is, I was like, yeah, I'm not off probation, you guys. I still got two more weeks. They're like, <laughs> yeah, but it's over. No, it's not no, over. No, it's the last couple of days. Right. Right? It's not over till it's over and you get that piece of paper. Yeah. So, uh, I got that piece of paper. There's so, like, you understand, I just got off probation a few, like a, a month ago. Oh, like is that right? Ago. I just got the piece oh, of paper a couple man. weeks ago. Feels good then. It was, listen, my buddy. off your back. My buddy Zach and, and Jeff were walking around with a piece of paper, like looking at it and like, aren't you excited? Aren't you? I'm like, eh. It's like, no, I'm, 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 I'm relieved, you know, but I'm not, you know. I'm relieved. I'm relieved because that last oh, month is, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's it, yeah, to a degree. Like, I have a massive restitution, but yeah. yeah write so, a check. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so. I saw that. Yeah, I read that. Uh, I had court costs, 300 something dollars. That was simple. That was easy. But, you know, that was, uh, there was something about being in prison that was uh, relieving, uh, was very, um, uh, thought provoking for me it was a, a good t it wasn't a good time but it wasn't a bad time it was time where i did a lot of reading mm -hmm. it was time when i did self reflection where i looked into myself and i said Steve, how'd you get here <laughs> right and it also gave me time to mm, scheme again <laughs> or to think about what the future brings uh a few people have that opportunity where you have all this free time sitting there in your cell or sitting there in the courtyard and you, you know you don't want to be hanging out with gangs or other people i pretty much was the lone wolf people would not mess with me but they wanted my onions and peppers right. so there was a certain respect that i got when i walked around but it gave me the ability to really 
evaluate what I've been doing in my life. And uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed reading. Um, I took every course I could on the Rosetta Stone. I can't tell you how many times I, I went through the uh, computer course. Uh, every program that was available, I signed up for. So I've got like 10 certificates, you know, from, uh, from prison. <laughs> okay. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I kept myself busy. That was the bottom line. Um, there was only one time that was a really uh, dark period for me in prison, and I came so close to uh, running away. I told you no gates. Yeah. And I knew Pensacola. Right. And uh, my daughter was getting married. Oh, uh, okay. That day was a terrible day for me. I said, I'm out of here. And I could have ran through this uh, not forest, but a wooded area. And there were um, tributaries that went out to the bay, went out to the gulf. And uh, I said, yep, I'll jump in the water. I'll find a sailboat that's unoccupied. Grab a sailboat <laughs> and back to Key West. I mean, you know, it was delusional, to right. say the least. And I'm so glad I didn't do it, but I thought I could do it. I mean, I had been thinking about that for a long time. I, oh, yeah, I could do this. Yeah, they won't catch me. Yeah, right. Um, so it's kind of funny when you're in that position and you don't want to be there, what you think you could do to get yourself out. Right. Thank God I did. Yeah, then, they, they, then they grab you and they throw you in a medium for the rest uh, of the time. Yeah. You'd be in a medium, it would really suck. Um, and, and I understand... Um, I'm fortunate to have had federal charges brought against me as opposed to state. Yeah. I've heard some really horrible things in state. Overcrowding, gangs. Oh, yeah. There's no air conditioning in the state of Florida. Oh. That. That's, that's See, I didn't know like that. Torture. Yeah, that's almost like torture. Yeah. No, I'm not doing yeah. that. So uh, it wasn't on that bad uh, prison. But, you know, being away from your family, being... Uh, also, then your life changed. You know, you can no longer pick up a phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there's all these little things that you just take for you, granted. You just go, wait, where are my kids? I, I don't see my kids. I don't do this anymore. I don't do that. But my, with my buds, you know, yeah. I my business is, I lost a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, hey, and that's how it works. There are consequences for your actions. That's what I learned. Yeah. So what are you doing? Uh, so what are you doing now? planning right <laughs> my future now what i'm doing is i'm a freelance captain right and what i do is i do delivery of boats and charters uh i even work in the oil fields in louisiana i drive some of the bigger boats 170 foot foot uh they call them mini supply vessels you know and what we'll do is we'll bring out people uh to the oil platforms uh well every week you uh have a shift in the employees you know the workforce. You bring new people in and you bring new people out. Uh, you bring their groceries, uh, their supplies, uh, things that they need for the drilling platform. Uh, and that's all you do 24 hours a day. Two captains, two mates. So you're on 12 hours, you're off 12 hours. Um, <laughs> and it's all weather. Uh, so you work 28 days, you got 14 days off. So what happened? And they feed you well, and they give you a lot of food. Anything you want, you can have. Now that's a good news. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything at the end of twenty-eight days. You got a nice paycheck right. that you blow in fourteen days, and you got to go back. Stop! Yeah, it's a blow. Um, so what? What? What do you mean all weather? What does that mean? Oh, you go out there and no storms, matter what, no matter what, you're out there rocking and rolling. Yeah, every time I see one of those. Uh, the uh, oil rig platforms. It's always the, the choppy, oh. you know, it's, yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's always like that, but I, I guess those are the videos that are popular ones where the waters, you know, it's oh. just sitting there as the waters everywhere. Those things seem like they're stable, but it's still terrifying. Summers are calmer than the winters. Winters are notorious for being rough. High winds, high waves. That's the deal. And you've got to steady the boat. So you have to sit there and unload it no matter what. Yeah, well, they have cranes. Okay. And you got to uh, position the boat close 
but not too close to the platforms. You can't hit. Yeah. Some of the boats have a thing called DP, dynamic positioning. Press a button, it will hold on station, regardless of the current, the wind, waves. You know, just like glue, you know, 5, 10 feet away from the, well, 10, 15 feet away from the platform. It's important because the crane's offloading and loading stuff on. So uh, DP is a great thing. Some of the boats, a lot of the boats don't have this. So you, for a couple hours, you've got to manually hold that boat into position and you focus in on one or two points on that platform and your concentration is right there. you got to maintain that. You can't even scratch your butt if you want. Um, that's difficult, uh, but it's part of the job. Um, and I was a I was a new guy, so I would always get the uh, overnight shift, the late shift, you know, midnight to twelve or six to six. Brutal, <laughs> brutal. But hey, that's a job. So I did that for a while. Uh, I just finished up a job. Uh, I did a seven-day charter up in New England. So I went to Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Cuddy Hunk, uh, traveled around with three people on a catamaran, 41-foot catamaran. And that was fun for me. We did some fishing and uh, met some really nice people. Next week, or well, let's see, I think it's the 10th, I fly to St. Lucia. I have uh, maybe 10 days, 7, 10 days with this one guy that just bought a catamaran, doesn't know how to sail, doesn't know how to drive. He needs an instructor. And the, more importantly, is the insurance company requires him to have 50 hours of instruction by somebody certified like myself. So he's got to get that requirement for the insurance company. But the guy doesn't know how to drive a boat and just bought a catamaran. Hmm. It's quite common. So this is what I do. Um, I'll go there and teach them. I did six years as a professor at the college in Key West. I taught marine engineering, coastal navigation, seamanship, diesel engine, gas engines, and fiberglass. So uh, I've got the credentials, and uh, the insurance companies are real happy with me. So that's what I'm doing, charging a guy an arm and a leg, and uh, he's got the money. He's a retired anesthesiologist. Mm. Um we just got divorced. It really kind of strange. He may have his ex-wife come with him. And I go, dude, really? <laughs> I said, Ooh. I said, this is better not get strange. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this ain't going to happen. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's good. Actually, I'm kind of looking forward to that. I do a lot of that. Anywhere from uh, Burlington, Vermont to Grenada. I, do, I spent a lot of time in the Bahamas, uh, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. John's. So your buddy contacted me, right? Yes. About your Gaston. Your, Gaston about your story. Right. He, is he a booking agent or yeah, what is he? What but is he? he's got contacts with people that right. supposedly are in. Right. So and I, I met a married couple while I was down there a couple four weeks ago. Real nice people. But I don't think they have the credentials or the uh, uh, experience to put this together, to be honest with you. And uh, I'm going, yeah, I, they wanted money up front from me. No. I'm going, wait a second. Well, uh, I, I was more concerned with the product being protected and, uh, and not being uh, scammed for their own purpose. I think I know the couple, by the way. Did they mention Picasso? Uh, the the thief of Picasso thief or something. Did they no. did they do documentaries? I don't think they do much. I, uh, they, they, no, I'm there. Right. Serious. They didn't have much experience. Yeah. I, well, because I, I was gonna say I met a couple one time who had done. Looking a couple both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, did a documentary. Uh, you know, he was the producer director. Their producer director. They did a documentary, and I actually went and saw the documentary, and it was horrific. And they contacted me about doing a documentary of my story. And I was like, yeah, bro. I said, honestly, I wouldn't, I'm not interested in you doing a doc on me. Oh, okay. Cause they, and they were like, well, what did you think? You saw the, the uh, Picasso thief of Picassos or the no, Picasso no, thief no, or something. Picasso, I, of Picasso of thieves. And I said, yeah, bro. I said, honestly, I said it was horrific. It was horrible. And he was like, well, you know, we, we had a, a very small budget. I said, I don't, small budget or not, you still need to know where to put the camera. 
Nice. Like you, you put the camera in the wrong place. Like it was cut up. It was, it was badly, it was just badly done. Like, I mean, the, uh, you know, so, well, you, you're only as good as like, you start making excuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it was, listen, bro, it was, it was bad. Yeah. It was just bad. Like there's no defending. I said, honestly, I said, my buddy, John Boziak and I, or me and Danny could have fucking thrown something better together that for, for virtually nothing. Wow. And, and, and so, you know, and so they didn't like that at all. I was like, no, I'm not trying to be insulting, but you know, you're trying to say you want to do my story. I'd rather see my story not get done at all than have it done that badly. <laughs> yeah. And so that didn't work out well. So when it, when I was just thinking, I was like, I was, and, it, and they were a married couple. So when they said married, married couple, I well, thought, you, you know, I had that business card. I never contacted them after that. Uh, I had breakfast with them and, uh, he was like, yeah, they're, they're going to write it, the synopsis, basically. And uh, I went... Have they? No. And I'll tell you why. And I'm thinking to myself, I could do a better job. I would have to educate them and give them all this background information. And they probably couldn't touch upon uh, that, that, the important parts as I could. I could right. do a better job. Right. I, I've got it up in my, he my head, you know. I'm an I'm an educated guy. Right, I can write. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, uh, well, I I think the problem is it's it's the problem with people because I get con contacted by people to write their stories, and it's always like, okay, well, you know, and one they don't want to pay you. Right. Well, I'll give you a percentage. Well, you know, we've had that discussion. Like the problem is they're always like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll give you. I always love the guys who are like, bro, I'll give you twenty five percent of it. First of all, twenty five percent. Like I'm not giving. You, it's not twenty five percent. It's more like you're getting twenty five percent. I'm the one doing all the work. You can't. You've got nothing without right. me. So, you know, it's like, so it, it turns into because when I was in prison, I would write someone's story. I'd give them fifty percent, and the people would say, well, you give them fifty percent. I was in prison. <laughs> I, think, I, I I don't have bills in prison. Right. You know, now I have bills, yeah. and I um. So you know, my whole thing is they think, oh, I'll give you a percentage. It's like you're going to give me a percentage of something that then I have to hand off to somebody else in the hope that they're going to get produced. Like that's so. Really, what happens is I end up being the producer also. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking twenty five. So I'm giving. You're saying you're going to be twenty five percent or even fifty percent to write your story. Take fifty percent of something that I now have to either produce myself or find a production company. I have to go to all the meetings, pitch all that. Then, when it's ready to get done, they then want you to sign additional documents. That now suddenly, you people. This is what happens, people. They find out that suddenly some production company wants to do a documentary on their life or a series, yeah. and they think they're big shots. Suddenly, they're like, "Well, I don't know if I want to go with that deal now." <laughs> it's like you were. Begging me yeah. to help you. Yeah. So most most of the time, the better course of action is just to hire somebody to write a synopsis. Or they think, write a book. Writing a book is a massive undertaking. Yeah. You're talking about working 40, 50 hours a week. It's a ton of research. It's going to take several months to do. Yep. You're going to you're looking between two, 200 to 300 pages. Luckily, people don't expect a 300-page book anymore. Nobody wants to read a book. And then you have to take that book and try and get it turned into something, try and get a publisher to publish it. If a publisher does publish it, you're going to get a dollar to a dollar fifty per book sale. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to make. They might give you a twenty thousand dollar advance, maybe. Then you don't get any more money until enough books have been paid. That means twenty thousand, at least right. fifteen to twenty thousand books have been sold to pay back the publisher. Then every book after that, you get a dollar. You get paid either biannually or annually. You're the one who's got to generate all those sales. Although it's exciting to go into Barnes and Nobles and see your book on the shelf, that is fleeting, and it's it's gone off the shelves very quickly and end up, ends up getting sold on Amazon. So your best bet is just to go to Amazon and make seven dollars per sale, and get a check every single week and be in control of it yourself, and nice. just pay out a little bit of money to have somebody do a professional cover and pay somebody to write a professional son or even better. Don't even do the book, scrap the book and just say, if you say, Hey, look, I don't have $25,000 to, to pay somebody to write a book. Or even you could probably go on Upwork or Fiverr and you can find a, uh, you can find somebody to write the book for you and they charge maybe 15 grand. It's not great. It still probably needs to be edited. They'll say it's great. Yeah, because they want their fifteen grand. Right, you get a two hundred page book. Maybe you could tweak it, go through it a few times, or hire somebody else for a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars to go through it and edit it. Um, in, in the end, you end up with a product that you're going to have to put on Amazon. Okay, so you could get it done for let's say under twenty grand. Um, so 
your best bet if your if your ultimate goal is hey i want to have my story out there and i want to try and pitch it to producers to try and get a, a netflix series or a movie or something like that or a documentary a doc a documentary is the the lowest point of entry so it's easier to get a doc made than it is a series or a film a feature film right. so mostly what the easiest course of action is get somebody to write a synopsis get that synopsis and get it out there to producers get a producer that's interested in it and keep in mind too if you're going to a producer and you say hey man i got a great story you give them a little they read the back jacket cover right the synopsis a little little less than 300 words they read it they go man this sounds interesting you go yeah i have a synopsis that's nine thousand words they could read that in an hour Mm -hmm. listen i go so far as all my synopses i've had a a narrator narrate them you don't even have to read it Mm -hmm. click this link and i have a narrator that will read it to you on your way to work because that's how lazy people are so they go oh my gosh this is amazing yeah i already have photographs all the photographs lined out lined up so with mine i put them on a website so you can go to the website and you can see all the photos as you read the story so like I'm laying it all out. Every producer I've gone to, when they go to the website, they're like, Jesus, bro. You've done their homework. You've done a whole, this is a whole pitch deck. Right. I'm like, right, because I know what lazy shits you are. <laughs> so what happens is, and then you can narrate it. The point is, is to get them interested and then want to do a doc. Because if they do a documentary on it, that documentary becomes a calling card to other production companies to want to come in and say, hey, let's do a series on, based on this person. So they, it's not that difficult to get Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or whoever to go and give you, give this producer half a million to a million dollars to do a, a three-part documentary. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to go in and say, hey, I need a $60 million budget to do a two-hour film or a series. I need a $20 million budget to do a, a first season, 10 episodes, $20 million, just to do that. Or you can give me half a million and I can get a three-part doc done. Or less than half a million, I get a one-hour doc done. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, For yeah. a few hundred thousand. So if you have a synopsis that you can hand out, they read it, they go, holy shit, this is a great story. The great thing about a synopsis too is it's only the highlights. So it's laid out in a what you can read it in one hour or have it read to you in one hour. And it's only the highlights. So all they get is the good shit. So they think, oh my God, if I can just get people that he knew to tell this story and throw some B-roll in there of ships and, you know, Miami or Key West or strip clubs and Russians. And, you know, I could throw that B-roll in there while these guys are telling the story. Like, that's a doc. Once that doc is made, we can turn it into a series or something else. You know, the problem is there's so many horrible people in Hollywood. Like, trust me, you'd rather deal. I'd rather deal with criminals than people in Hollywood. They'll lie. They'll never tell you no. They lie to your face. And what they do is this. It's first they have a meeting with you. Go, oh my God, this is amazing. Uh-huh. This has happened to me over and over and over again. Uh-huh. Matt, what an amazing story. I'm going to put my team together. I shit you not. If I hear one more fucking person <laughs> say, I'm going yeah. to talk to my team next week. My team's going to get together next week and I'm going to pitch it to my team. Okay. Two weeks later, you get a, the email back or the phone or the text message that says, "My, they love it. We're going to talk to Jan at Netflix. We're good friends, Jan and I. She runs she runs the doc department there. Okay. Two weeks after that, maybe a month later, you send them a text. Hey, whatever happened? I didn't hear back from you. Sorry. she's uh, She loves it. Very interested. She's going to talk to Bill. A week later, Bill's on vacation. He gets back at the end of whatever okay then you hear that he said he likes it we're gonna they're gonna get together they're gonna talk at their monthly meeting okay we're now four months in by the way three to four months in then it becomes matt unfortunately they do love it they're super interested we're gonna have a meeting next week you have that meeting then they go unfortunately matt nothing gets is getting done over the holidays the holidays for hollywood is from basically the end of basically the beginning of november until the end of january like there's three months that apparently nobody works and they'll tell you this with a straight face you're telling me that nobody works <laughs> for three months in hollywood nice and then at the end of that those months you either never hear from them again 
or you get another phone call where these people said no, but they're starting the process over with Discovery Channel. So they start at like, they start at like, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, uh, HBO, you know, these big, and then as though they, tr- as they go through those companies start saying, no, 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 it gets down to FX, um, you know, uh, Discovery Channel, they start lower, lower, lower to the point where it's like, you know, they're trying to do a doc, an ent- a one hour documentary for the people that want $30,000 to do or $60,000 to do an entire, what to do a one hour doc, which is the people from the Picasso people. Yeah. Um, and really that's just align their pockets with 40 grand and spend two months to try and throw something together. Cause all they have to do is throw some piece of garbage together that they can put on. They'll, they'll try and put something on a uh, Roku or Amazon. Cause Amazon has like a Roku version. So it's not, they'll say, Oh, it's on Amazon. It's not on Amazon. It's not on prime, bro. It's yeah. on, you know, any, I can upload. You, you can pretty much, anybody can pretty much upload to Amazon or to um, Roku they put it up there and maybe you get paid back the 60, which probably not. You might make five or $10,000 back at some point and the money's gone and that's it. So what's happened. So, but the easiest course of action is to take the synopsis, take a synopsis, take the photos, put it all together, put it on some, like put it on my website or a website, something where you can give them a link. They can go there and they can see the whole thing. And I'll show you my website and everything. Then you pitch like for instance, this right here, you go out and you tell the story on different platforms. When you tell the story on about different platforms, producers will start reaching out to you and they'll say, Hey, I love your story. I understand, you know, uh, have you, do you have a book? Have you signed with anybody yet? Do you have, you can say no, but I have a pitch deck or a synopsis that I put together along with all the photographs. So what you're really telling them is like in Hollywood, a synopsis is a pitch deck, right? It's the basically the story. The I have a bunch of photographs. Photographs are they call them assets, right? Mm-hmm. So I have a bunch of I have kind of like a, a pitch deck or a synopsis, and I have a bunch of assets that on a website I can send you the link. And I also have a narrated version of the story. It takes about an hour. You can read it in an hour, or you can uh, I have a narrated version in an hour. And they go, Wow. You give them that. They read it, they come back, and you start the process in the hopes that at some point you don't get down to the Roco people. At some point you get to the Netflix people or the or the, um, or the the uh, Discovery people, and they say, hey, we want to make a doc. Because if you can get a doc made, it should be – it's an easier step from a documentary to a series or a feature film. Because then people know who you are. Then it becomes, oh, my God, this was the next Cowboys or this was right. this and – now they're ready to do a whole series or do a, hey, we should take this guy's character and turn it in. This could be a whole series and let's let's get a writer. And then they they get a writer. Some writers writes a couple of a couple of episodes based on your story. They pitch it. They say, this is great. We can do this for twenty or thirty thousand dollars a season. And it starts off. The next thing you know, it runs for six or eight seasons. And, you know, it's great. But I mean, it, it is a horrific, a horrific um, um, process to go through. Like right now, I remember we went through my website earlier and I was showing you all the ones that had been optioned that I had optioned. And like right now I'm working with, um, my personal story was optioned. It, I actually just signed a shopping agreement, but whatever, it, it's a very, the distinction's minor um, with a company called uh, Foundation Media Partners. And they've done a bunch of a, bu- a bunch of stuff and I've gone out to, Los Angeles and met with them. I also optioned another, uh, I think eight stories with a company called, uh, law and crime. It, there's a law and crime network, law and crime, uh, production company films, whatever. And they do docs. Um, and I'm currently working to pitch another one of my stories. I'm pitching other stories. I had one story that was rolling stone was supposed to pick up. Um, but basically I've, it's, it's, we've kind of blown that off. Um, so I've got other ones that I'm pitching and they're, they're these, all these guys are putting stuff together right now, you know, but even now I don't necessarily believe I've had guys that have told me this, um, well, you know, it doesn't really mean anything until you get, and keep in mind, these people are paid me. They'll pay you for an option. Right. They're giving me checks. Like they're not walking away from, you think, oh, they're not going to walk away from 10 grand or five grand, but they will. Or a lot of times they'll try and tell you, oh, you don't get it. You don't get any money for an option. Like that's a lie. 
you can get bought. They'll, they pay. They always try and not pay you. So the point is, is that once that right now they're making phone calls, like they leave literally this one company, they have made tons of phone calls. I mean, this one woman at this company, Law and Crime, she spent a ton of time talking to people. They've got, they've got whole lists of people they've spoken with that are ready to be a part of these documentaries. Now they're putting together a deck and they're going to go pitch it to Amazon or whoever they're going to pitch it to and, and turn these things into, um, documentaries. So the point is, is that I know guys that have literally told me, and still, I don't necessarily know that anything's going to get made and they've done all this work. Mm -hmm. I still don't know. I know guys I've had producers say, well, you know, it doesn't really count with matter until the check gets cut. But I actually met a producer who said that doesn't matter either. No. And I go, what do you mean? He said, I had a, a, a documentary get greenlit. We signed all the paperwork. I got the first check. I don't know if it was 5 million or 10 million. This is for like a series. The company got bought out. And then within that, when that check got cut, within days or a week that they had uh, bought out, they came to him and said, we need our money back. He said, what are you talking about? I've got a green lit. I've already signed the contract. I got the money. And they said, you'll return the money. We have to repitch that to the new owners. And they said, if you don't return it, we can, one, we'll sue you. It's like, I got a standard contract. <laughs> we can sue you. Or even if you win it, you'll never, you'll never, we'll never buy anything from you again. And you won't get a second check anyway. Like the doc's not getting, or the this, this series is not getting made in general. If you want to even have a chance, return the money. Right. And I said, what'd you do? He's like, return the money. I'm like, my God. Minus man. expenses. You had a project greenlit. You got a check and yeah. you had to return it. So it's never a go until that thing is on, until it's on Amazon, pro, until it's on Prime yeah. or Netflix or Hulu, or you're watching it in the theaters, I wouldn't even believe it. Can you imagine how fucking horrible these people are? And they'll listen, they got no problem asking you to do this and do that. Meet with this person. Can you have this meeting? Do you know how many Zoom calls I've been on with four or five people? All of them telling me they love me. Yeah. Matt, you're amazing. Your story's amazing. I've never heard anything like this. I'm so shocked somebody hasn't snatched this up. Uh, yeah. Matt, this is a this is a slam dunk. Yeah, yeah. Good bro, stop with the slam dunk. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I love it when I start telling them what's, what's about to happen. I say, let me tell you what's about to happen. After this meeting, you're going to tell me you're going to call somebody at Netflix because you're personal friends with them. <laughs> then you're going to, and I'm going to, I go through the whole thing. You can look at their faces. And they go, this guy's experience. They're like, fuck. And they're like, Matt, I, I, I know you've been, it sounds like you've been jerked around. That's not our practice. That's yeah, not yeah, how yeah. we do business. And then over the next six months, they do exactly what I said yeah. was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible business. At least in prison, if you just blatantly lie to someone over and over and over again, you get to go up and just, or, or you get your ass beat or somebody stabs I, you. They, they call you out on it. Yeah, yep. exactly. At least to their face, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. Here's what I said I was going to do. And this happened, this happened. And now I'm not going to do it. And at least you know. But with these guys will drag you and drag you and drag you. And I was told one time by a producer, a friend of mine, he said, the reason they don't want to, they don't want to say no to you. Because one, they're going to run into you again over and over again. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to be that jerk off that said no. And what if your next project is amazing? They want you to pitch it to them again. Mm -hmm. So it, you could get, if you, they don't want to be the guy that, you know, it, it really is kill the messenger, right? Like they don't want to be the guy that said, I'm sorry, but, yeah. but Jim over and Tom and Paul at, 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 uh, Amazon prime, um, said they, they, they don't like the, the project or at Hulu. They, they said, absolutely not. Cause now I associate you with a failure. And I don't bring anything to you. Instead, they want to say, look, I don't know what's going on, Matt. I'm waiting for them. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that way, in three months or a year and a half from now, when you have another project and you call them out or you see them at a party and you say, hey, man, I got another project. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I want to hear about it. What are you, what are you doing, bro? I heard you got some. What is it? Man, I'm so sorry about that, that the yeah. other story. I don't know what's wrong with those guys. I mean, I tried so hard for you and I... You know, it's just a standard thing. Right. So the, the best bet, and really it, it's better than writing a book, is to write a synopsis. You know, you write a synopsis, 
you put together the assets, you pitch it because you're in a better position to get them to pay attention to a synopsis. And you're asking for a, a lower point of entry, which is a doc. A doc's an easier sell for them. Mm-hmm. And docs will make tons of money. Docs are huge money makers for like Netflix. Netflix puts in $20 million on a series. It might go one or two seasons. They may lose their ass on it. That's $40 million that, that, and it brought in virtually nothing. But if they said, hey, we gave him, um, this one guy, a million dollars for this doc, and it's a three-part series, and it's the next Cowboys. They're like, this is, so oh my God, what a moneymaker we just made. What a great investment that was. So, and then, of course, if it does well, now you turn around and say, great, now we want to turn it into a series. And they go, of course, of course, there's huge interest in this. So, yeah. The best bet is, in my opinion, synopsis, you know, synopsis. And then you push this off, you you know, well, first you do, you do this, you do one of the, as many of these as possible because the, the producers will reach out to you. By the time producers reach out to you, you've got, you've already got the synopsis. Here's a synopsis. Mm -hmm. They read the synopsis and they go, damn, this is something, this is good. That's the best bet. And really just to write, write, if you just write an outline and build off of the outline it's a it's easy it's not different you can read any of the ones on my on my um it's like an article it's like reading a a, an article in rolling stone magazine it's easy and then it's yours um that to me is the best course of action see he is where i'm at is that i go back to this extraordinary is it extraordinary for other people or is it just ordinary as I see it? For me, I just, it's its so ordinary. I just go, huh, really? You're, you're impressed by that? Or you think that's, that's good? I, I don't have that flavor, that uh, uh, that feeling. Because, uh, yeah, but because you didn't, you're not, you know, if, if, if you. I'm inside yeah. going, right. this is what I do. Right. It's like it's the fish in water, right? Like a fish doesn't even realize he's surrounded by water. Everybody thinks that I've got the greatest job in the world. Oh, man, you're so lucky. You're, you're living the dream. And I go, no, I'm working on boats. Right. <laughs> I'm out there 24 hours a day in high seas. And I say, this is my job. And, oh, man, I love to I said, well, that's because you got a, a, a sad story about your life, you know. Well, I mean, I think. So maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, this is a very appealing to a lot of people. And if it is, maybe it's something we could capitalize on. Um, I don't, uh, how do I say this? Money doesn't interest me as much as it should. I'm going to tell you that. It should because I'd be a lot wealthier than I am today. But I've always gone ahead. And no matter what path or what decision I make, I do two things. Number one, I sleep on it. If you sleep hot at night, you know how disruptive that can be. Whether you're having trouble falling asleep, you're waking up sweating in the middle of the night, or all of the above, that's where GhostBed can help. As the makers of the coolest beds in the world, GhostBed is your go-to for cooling mattresses, cooling pillows, and cooling bedding. From their signature ghost ice fabric to patented technology that adjusts to your body's temperature, every ghost bed mattress is designed with cooling in mind. So whether you want a plusher mattress that cushions your shoulders and hips or a firm option with exceptional support, your ghost bed will keep you cool and comfortable all night long. When you purchase a ghost bed mattress, your comfort is guaranteed. You can try out your mattress for 101 nights risk-free to make sure it's the right fit for you. Plus they offer free shipping and most items are shipped within 24 hours. If you're not sure which ghost bed is right for you, check out their mattress quiz. You'll answer a few questions and get a personalized recommendation. Even better, our listeners can get 50% off site-wide for a limited time. Just visit ghostbed.com slash cox and use the code cox at checkout. Again, that's ghostbed.com slash cox with the code cox at the checkout to save a whopping 50% off site wide. Mm-hmm. Number two is, uh, yeah, generally I wake up in the morning, I know exactly the right answer, but I always go what's going to make me feel better as opposed to what's going to make me financially more secure. Mm-hmm. And I've always taken that path. And uh, at some point in time, I need to readjust that. <laughs> I need to, you know, save for retirement. <laughs> I'm 70. I know. I'm going, yeah. shit, man. Yeah. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, 
Uh, anyway, uh, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm interested. I'm going. Well, I'm, I'm, we got to talk to Gaston. Yeah, Gaston. Gaston. Yeah, he's a good guy. You say Gaston or Gaston? Gaston. No, I say that it's Gaston. Gaston. G a s t o n. Okay. Uh, he's the one that's kind of pushing me and saying, "Steve, this is it. This could be your big break." I'm going when you were describing what the uh, producers were telling you. I'm going here. He is telling me oh, it's going to be great. Maybe it is. We'll see. Yeah, that's the whole. Th Listen, I uh, you know we don't know. Do you I know how many people? I wish I came up with Hakatui. Oh, like. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I'm going, you're kidding. Oh, she's huge, right? Yeah, Jelly's going, oh, man, Steve, think of something. What? <laughs> it got off door. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the whole thing is it just doesn't, you know, you just don't, you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know, you know, you, well, you got to get on if you don't, podcasts. If you put no effort into it, you'll not reap any reward. That's yeah, you know what's funny? I was talking to a guy the other day who was telling me about his podcast, Yeah. Colby knows who he is, but he, he was like, I don't know what's the problem is. It's just not, it's not taken off. And I'm, 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 you know, it's just, it, it's not. And I went, well, you know, you're, you're, and Colby and I had talked to him. I said, well, you know, I told you your, your thumbnails are horrible. The thumbnails are yeah. the little picture. I said, the th thumbnails are horrible. And he, and I go, and, and you need to interview people. I said, and, and honestly, I said, um, I said, you're like, you don't post regularly enough. He's like, they get two or 3000 views and that's it. I said, you don't post regularly enough. You don't interview people and your thumbnails are horrible. He's like, I know, I know. He said, I'm, 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 I go, you're not putting enough effort into it. He's like, I know, but it's just not taken off. I said, stop it. I said, don't sit here and tell me that you know what the problem is. And you're not, you're not correcting it. And you're upset because it's not taking off. Like if you've given it a genuine effort. And it doesn't take off. I'll listen to you say, and I'll I'll listen. I'll sympathize with you and say, man, I know it's fucking. You gave it your all, and you did a great job. And the thumb. I don't know what the problem is either. But you know what? I don't know anybody that's done all of those things, and it hasn't taken off. Mm -hmm. So if you know, what I'm saying like, I don't. We don't know anybody. Like we've never met anybody and said your thumbnails are perfect. Right. Your 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 view time is perfect. Your your interviews are great. You're posting regularly, and your channel sucks. I don't know. We never followed up with your channel sucks. It's always like. This is good. This is good. This is good. And look, your numbers are amazing. And, they're, and you know what they're saying? They're like, yeah, I know. I know. Right. So no guy ever comes to us and gives us a channel to look at. Because guys will come and say, yeah, I don't know what the problem with my channel is. Colby will look at it and say, well, I'll tell you right now. Your titles are no good. Yeah. Your thumbnails are this. And you needed this. This is good. And this is good. But these three things are bad. If you change those three things, I'm telling you right now, give that, do that for the next two or three months. And your channel will start, you'll start bringing in numbers. That's what happens. See, you could, it's always easy to pinpoint because we've already made all those mistakes. Right. So never does somebody go and if they change all those things, does their channel continue to suck? That just doesn't happen. So it's it's hard to say. Persistency. There. Exactly. Persistence. You, ha you have that's to. Put, what, you got to put the right. time in. If you put the time in and it falls apart, okay, I get it. But I just don't know anybody that's putting the time in and it's still falling apart. You know. Interesting. Right. Yeah. You have to stick with it. Oh, I do know people that have, put, have perfect channels, put them out done all the effort and it doesn't it doesn't take off mm -hmm. and they go i don't know what's wrong well it's been a month yeah. like it's been a month bro that's it yeah, we man. did we did this for three we did this for months. six months to a year or two, 18 months before it took off so i'm sorry that in your 30 days of effort you yeah, didn't right. see a maximum yeah, return cool. <clears throat> and then they'll go well johnny mitchell's channel like bro johnny mitchell you're comparing yourself to Johnny Mitchell? <laughs> you think you're Johnny, or you think you're Joe Rogan? Well, you know, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan? Yeah, right. <laughs> you're not, don't even compare yourself yeah, right. to Joe Rogan. That's never, there's never going to be another Joe Rogan. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Hattori's right on us. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But can, can she carry on a conversation? We don't no. really know. Um, <laughs> she could give, like, maybe she could just give... Uh, do a whole channel just interviewing girls and giving bad relationship advice that could be you know whatever she's doing or she's maybe doing well. maybe it's I mean, she maybe it's good relationship advice because from my from what i've heard she's got she's she's wait, probably wait, got a good wait wait she had another and it's not a mnemonic another she goes she said so what's good for the whole might not be good for your soul Oh yeah, and then that's, <laughs> oh, you're shit, Nate. Yeah, that's another way to. I'm going. 
Oh, and you just go, really? I just, listen, I saw there was a whole, that one right yeah, there. Yeah. I heard it because it went, it, it's, guys were like, she did it again. Because she says it like that. Yeah, right. And people are like, this is going to go huge now. So I don't know. No, that, that not. But the fact that we both heard um, it might mean something. Negative publicity. I don't say anything that everybody knows. Well, listen to me. You will. I know. How do you, by the way, how do you have such a thick fucking head of hair? It's ridiculously thick. You're 70 years old and you have an amazing head of hair. And it's it's horrible. It makes me feel. Listen, that ain't the only thing that works for me. <laughs> Unbelievable. I get lucky every night. Look. Every night I get like. I go home by myself. <laughs> Jeez. When you get to be my age, you've got retreads. You got ladies that you know, I'm getting hit on all the time. And I, I'm definitely afraid of uh, these dating apps. I mean, I'm going, you're kidding me, man. I mean, they've gone through post-menopause. Yeah, post-menopause, the hormones are out of whack. These are wackadoodles. And you're just going, I don't want to go ahead and get myself. I'm going, get, yeah, no way. <laughs> you know, they're looking for another romance and somebody else to take care of them. I said, find somebody else. It ain't me. Anyway. Well, you guys get one of the ones that. I tell them, I said, you know, this relationship, and, you know, it's kind of new to me. I, gee, I, I think we ought to go for a test drive first. <laughs> You got to find one that married a millionaire and he passed away and she's worth $5 million. I'm thinking yeah, I'm going to promote myself to, uh, uh, when's that, uh, um, a, a, a gray, gray daddy app? <laughs> wait, wait, oh, uh, uh, sugar daddy? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, but gray daddy, you know, for the older ladies, you know, the, the, the ladies said. Uh, the cougars. No, the Beyond cougars. Cougars. no, not the Beyond, cougars. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't want the cougars. You want the ones that are the widowers. Widows? Yeah. Widows. Yeah. Divorcees. Oh. Ooh, Lord settlement. I should go hang down at the courthouse and find out what the settlements were. Hey, you guys. I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. If you like the video, hit the subscribe button. Consider joining my Patreon. It's $10 a month. It really does help. Colby and I uh, make videos like this also. If you want to contact me, if you have interest in Steve's story, please let me know. My email is in the description box. You can send me an email if you have any interest. You want to reach out, see what we can do with the story. Uh, once again, thank you very much, and I appreciate you guys watching. See ya. Hot tui. All right. <laughs>